welcome back to our series on the eight short preludes and fugues. And today we've reached number three, the E minor one. And the main thing I want to talk about today is hemiolas and how we deal with them. But first of all, just a couple of words about the composer. Who actually wrote this piece? Well, this E minor prelude and fugue is, in my view, one of the best written of the set. What I mean by that is that although the pieces as a whole are of fairly high quality, nevertheless, there are places here and there where the composer seems to have got himself into a bit of a hole. Um, seems, for example, to have made errors of logic and ended up having to avoid parallel fifths or parallel octaves, or uh, having written a melodic line which seems to be heading to the wrong place and requires a bit of a swerve to get out of it. This piece, however, seems to be thoroughly in control at all times and doesn't really have any issues, any problems. So this is a composer who really is capable and can write in a consistently high quality. All of which brings me to the point, who actually wrote this piece and who actually wrote the set? You know, there's been no shortage of discussion on the matter and all kinds of composers have been proposed ranging from Bach's sons to Bach's pupils to other minor composers in Germany. There are some puzzling things. One is the rather inconsistent quality, which we've already referred to, that some of the pieces actually seem better written than others. There's also the huge diversity of styles. When you look at it, some of the pieces, like the G major and the A minor, are in a kind of North German idiom, rather rhapsodic, illustrating different parts of, a, uh, of, the, of an instrument. Others, like this E minor and the G minor, seem to have this sense of quiet control, as well as a penchant for purple moments, uh, unexpected chords or unexpected uh, notes. And some, like the first one, have an Italianate feel to them. So there's this huge range of different styles, which makes us think that this is a composer perhaps who is composing a set of pastiche pieces, demonstrating a mastery of all these different styles, and, and that would fit with the idea of a pupil composer. But there is another possible explanation, which, so far as I know, has never been mentioned. So the only things we can be reasonably sure about is that this is a set, a deliberate set of eight pieces in ascending key order, all of roughly the same length, and that at some time or another, this set was for one reason or another attributed to J.S. Bach. The original manuscript, of course, would have provided us with some answers, but that is long since lost, and all that we have surviving is copies. But I wonder if I could toss out a, a, a new idea here. It's pure speculation, and you can do with it as you wish. All the arguments which have been proposed before, so far as I'm aware, suggest that one composer wrote the whole set. Let's just speculate a little and suggest that perhaps there is an alternative to that. So bear with me for a moment if I indulge in a bit of fantasy. Let's imagine that J.S. Bach brings together his four best pupils and sets them a task, an end of term exam perhaps, or a competition, and says each of them should write two short preludes and fugues to form a set. And they get together and say, well, Bach likes things to be in order. He likes um, regular sets of things. So let's do them 
I, as I said, in a sending order, and they distribute the keys between themselves and go away and write to each and hand them in. And J.S. Bach then corrects their efforts. That, although it's a pure speculation, that would actually answer some of the issues. It would explain why some of the pieces are quite simply better written than others. That would be the better pupils. It would explain why there seem to be pairs uh, to each of different styles, because that was perhaps the preferred style of the various pupils. It would explain why, where the composers seem to have got themselves into a bit of a hole. It's been very neatly sidestepped and corrected, because if Bach then went through and corrected their mistakes, then it would have been put uh, right very skillfully. And, of course, it would explain how some editor or collector at a future date had managed to attribute this collection to J.S. Bach, if Bach had actually written on the manuscript and made annotations. Pure speculation, there's not a shred of evidence for it, but it's an alternative way of looking at the whole question. So I'll leave that with you to dream about and go on to what I really want to talk about today, which is hemiolas. The term hemiola can mean a variety of different things, but what we're referring to today is when music has been in a regular three time, dum, 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 and suddenly switches to effectively three bars of two time. So dum, 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 da, dum, da, dum, da, dum, 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 da, dum, dum, and so on. Why does a composer do that? It was a very common thing to do in the 18th century. Well, the answer is very simple. It disrupts the flow. It waves a big flag and says, here you need to pay attention. Something is happening. Something important is about to happen. You know, if you're driving a car along a main road and there's a big junction just coming up, then the road authorities might well have painted so-called rumble strips in the road. Paint which makes a sound as your tyres go across it. It disrupts the flow, it makes the regular beat of the wheels against the tarmac into something entirely different that you can hear. And that makes you aware that there is a danger ahead. It makes you aware to look out for the signs for this big junction which is coming up. Well, a hemiola does exactly the same thing in musical terms. So when a major event is about to occur and the equivalent of a big junction in a piece of music is perhaps a cadence which establishes firmly a new key, um, the hemiola will then function as a kind of rumble strip which tells you, look out, here is a major structural cadence just coming up. So in this E minor fugue, the first really major structural event is when we arrive at the dominant B minor in bar 28. And immediately preceding that, there is this stonking great hemiola pointing it out to us, this one. <laughs> And at bar 45, we return to the tonic, and that's flagged up by this rather unusual beast, a double hemiola, that is to say, two hemiolas back to back. And that's one heck of a rumble strip. So when we get these hemiolas, it's good that we're aware of them and we adjust our articulation accordingly. Really feel the two-time beat there. It's a very deliberate technique on the part of the composer. It's important uh, as part of the design of the piece. And we really need to bring that out and make a thing of it. Mm. 